name is Elena Avila. I am a curandera. I'm also a master's prepared nurse. I grew up in El Paso, Texas. My parents were both from Mexico, so they brought the medicine with them. My mother knew all of the folk diseases and remedies. My grandmother was also a curandera on my father's side. And so I grew up with curanderismo. And cura means to heal, and it's also another word for priest. Curanderismo is a mixture of Spanish, indigenous, and African medicine that was um, assimilated when all three peoples came together uh, during the conquest of this continent. Well, it's hard for uh, all us Mexican Americans to be put in one pot. And so, because we come from uh, different educational and socioeconomic levels, some people believe that the only ones that, that the only Mexican Americans that believe in curanderismo come from the lower socioeconomic level, but actually that's really not true. Um, but it's, it's really hard to categorize all of us. I can tell you generally that we, um, we see things holistically. The community is very important. Family is very important. Um, the way we view um, mental illness, illness, for instance, in, uh, in Mexico, the indigenous people of this continent don't even have a name for mental illness. It's some sort of disharmony as, as any other illness would be. Whether, whether it's caused by uh, genetically or, um, or by trauma or whatever. Uh, we look at the whole environment. For instance, I don't see a diagnosis in a person. What I see is, is that person itself, that, that person, I see that person. I always like to ask the person, how can I be of service to you? Whether they're schizophrenic, whether they're hearing impaired, whether they're blind, whether they're rich or poor, whether they've just been given a Western diagnosis of cancer or whatever. It doesn't matter to me. I just don't see that person as a diagnosis. So I ask that person, how can I be of service to you? What do you need? And so we view mental illness in, in much the same way. We don't use a clinical diagnosis such as schizophrenia or manic depressive or, or so forth. Um, we might use things like um, they had a, a choque, you know, some sort of shock or um, nervous breakdown, you know, that's more a, a kind of a, a folk way of looking at it. But um, there are some of us that believe that the cause of mental illness comes from bad luck or, 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 or curses. And um, or some disruption in the family or the community. Um, others really believe that deep down they know that, that it's just something genetic that happened. Um, some Mexican Americans believe that uh, people with quote uh, clinically diagnosed schizophrenia uh, have special powers. In Native American cultures, many times uh, these mentally ill people are given a, a higher status in the community uh, as soothsayers, as, as, as uh, wise people. And so um, there's many ways that we actually look at the mentally ill. With people that, when people come to see me and they believe that their son or daughter or relative um, has a mental illness because of a curse. I like to educate and empower them. I tell them that we're actually basically always cursing each other. We have bad thoughts about other people. Um, if um, if a woman's going to divorce her husband, that that husband might actually be cursing her, whether it's verbal or nonverbal. You know, I, I hope you never find anybody. I hope horrible things happen to you. We're always doing that. That that's how we curse each other. The medical profession also curses by um, saying, stating uh, that you know you have cancer and you have six months to live. Some people actually die exactly six months later. They take the curse. What I like to tell people is that we don't have to take other people's curses. 
they say that there are actual professionals that you can pay money to that they where whereas they can um, um, do these curses for a price you know in other words uh, hex people for a price uh, do some whatever they do put them under some spell or do or maybe put pins on a voodoo doll and actually cause people to go crazy um, I've never met anybody um, I suppose there are some people that uh, do that but mostly we we just curse each other and what I like to tell people is that um, that since all of us uh, curse each other, perhaps there were some people that um, uh, cursed their family, but that I truly do not believe that this mental illness comes from curses. And, and so I really like to educate and empower people on that. Uh, because many times they do not, might not be able to get the, the diverse care that that person needs. They also become victims for other so-called healers that take their money promising a cure and I see a lot of people that come to me as a result of that they've just given away their life savings in trying to to uh, find a cure there's no easy answers to this I like to tell people that um, I, we wish we had a magic pill we wish we could just lay their the hands their hands on on that on their loved one and make them all well but um, that's not the way life is. Whether they have diabetes or a mental illness, whatever that illness is, it's like how can we as, as healers, uh, as health care providers, what can we do, what can the patient do to, so that they can reach their potential, regardless of their, quote, diagnosis. Yes, some of the some of the uh, folk diseases in curanderismo. Uh, one of them is envidia, envy. It's an emotional illness. Envy is a normal emotion, but if we spend too much time fantasizing or wishing we had that slim figure or we had so and so's um, power and status or so and so's money or their house or their car uh, or the right relationship, whatever it is that we're coveting, um, that if we spend too much time on on that, then, then we can develop uh, what I call el corazón torcido, the twisted heart, whereas we spend a, a lot of our essence on wishing we were somebody else. It's a very destructive disease. I see a lot of NVIDIA in my practice. It comes from deprivation. It comes from not having enough love as a child. And so we leave the nest hungry and we want this and we want that and so forth. It can actually lead to suicide or homicide. And people get so envious that they actually kill the person that they uh, are envying or they become so depressed that they many times take their lives. So uh, we acknowledge that envy is a serious disease. Another serious disease that we see is um, a disease that we call susto. And susto comes from the belief that our soul is just as important as any aspect of our body, uh, mental, uh, physical, emotional, that we have a soul and a spirit. And when we suffer a, a, a traumatic experience, a fright, uh, where, whether it's we were sexually abused or whether we went to war or whether we were physically abused or were involved in a, um, a, a car accident or a plane accident, whatever caused that trauma, that a part of our soul stays where the trauma occurred. And that curandera needs to go back with the, with the uh, patient, the client, and retrieve that aspect of the soul because then you have a part of you missing. And life is hard enough without that part missing. We need that part. The curandera is always doing soul retrievals, whether she's doing a limpia or actually calling the ceremony a soul retrieval. We're always cognizant of the fact that we have a soul and spirit. So even a, a 
rubbing an ache over your body and, and you know, being seen as a simple limpia, we're doing a soul retrieval. We, curanderas, curanderos, have never separated soul and spirit from, from medicine. So we do practice medicine and spirituality simultaneously. So we're always aware that that, that person has a soul and a spirit. So susto is um, a diagnosis, quote unquote, that um, is very common in curanderismo. But it doesn't have a, um, a set of di symptoms as, as Western medicine does. Um, Western medicine will classify a mental illness or an emotional illness with, uh, with symptoms. We recognize that the soul is very unique and, and very in diverse, so I don't look at particularly at symptoms. I look at you. I look at that person and see how it, that soul loss manifests and it all, always manifests in a different way. Another folk disease that we have is empacho, and empacho basically just means a blockage, and it could be blockage of the intestines. We're told that if, as children, if we swallow our gum, we can get empacho, or if, or if we eat um, uncooked dough, we can get empacho. Basically, it's whatever gives us digestion. Uh, digestive problems, whatever that is. For some of us it could be milk products and for some others it could be a lot of sugar, whatever gives us digestive problems. But we also uh, recognize that we can have empacho of the soul, uh, a blockage of the soul when we're not being true to ourselves. Uh, for instance, I'm also a poet. If I don't write poetry, I get empacho, I have a blockage. Um, my soul needs to express itself in poetry. So we can also have that. Sometimes we can have empacho uh, spiritually. We were perhaps we were raised in one religion and we no longer fits us. We haven't found a, a, a religious experience, a religious um, um, a religion that that fits us. And so we talk, many of us talk about not being able to connect to God. Um, feeling lost in that, not really knowing what we believe in spiritually, and that could also be a block. So, um, and other folk diseases that we recognize are, one of them is malojo, and it's translated as the evil eye. Uh, this is a very common uh, folk disease in many, many cultures, the Jewish culture, the Italian culture. And um, I don't believe it's the evil eye. I, I believe uh, if, that it was translated wrong it, because mal it also is a, a, a sickness and basically it comes from prolonged gazing that when we gaze and stare and stare and stare at another individual usually because they're very beautiful there's something about them we admire that we stare at them that that person that's being stared at especially if they're a small child could get sick they could get um, um, insomnia can get colicky can get restless and so forth uh, as any mother knows, when you take a young child to a party and they're overstimulated with a lot of people touching them and holding them, usually children don't tolerate that very well. Prolonged gazing can also come from envy. We can look at, stare at somebody that we're envying, but we can stare at them with mixed feelings of hate or revenge or so forth, you know, because we want what they have. So. Those are some of the folk diseases that are more common in curanderismo. But the curandera or the curandero doesn't just treat folk diseases, they treat whatever makes people uh, sick, whatever makes people unhappy. And so there's like this whole range of, of uh, maladies that are not diagnosed. And, and, and I stress that we don't, um, we don't really treat the diagnosis, we treat that person. You know, we might um, come up with susto or uh, empacho, but the most important thing is how does that person express that disharmony, that, that illness, and, how, and what can we do to, to assist them. Yes, well, there's, uh, there can be um, specialties 
Um, for instance, like the sobadora is a person that does massage, but usually that person that does massage also does limpias and also might be very knowledgeable on herbology. There's some that um, just specialize in herbs. There's some that just specialize in, in doing ceremony, ritual, limpias, spiritual cleansings. Um, and there are some that are called curanderos total that do everything and are able to treat everything. We also work with other medical practitioners, so we also refer. We might refer a, a person to a doctor for um, certain tests or for certain illnesses, and so we, we do really believe in, in referral. Or to our curandera friend that knows more about herbs than you know perhaps I do. So we're very in touch with um, uh, a community of, of healers uh, helping that person. Person. We know that that person heals in a very diverse way and that there's many medicines that, that help. Um, manzanilla is very common. And, um, and first of all, I must say to you that I, that's not my specialty, but I can tell you that some of the most common ones, but manzanilla, and, um, which is chamomile, um, yerba buena, uh, which is peppermint. There's, um, um, depending on the reg region too. So, I mean, I can, I can, you know, talk about some, but basically in central Mexico or in southern Mexico or, or in other parts of the country, mo mostly the most popular ones are the ones that are popular within your region, the ones that, that grow well in your re region. For instance, Ruda and Romero are very common in this area for limpias because we also use the herbs for spiritual cleansings. They grow very well here, rosemary and rue. And so they're very commonly um, um, used in this area. But you might go to, um, to Mexico City and there will be other herbs. I think the most important to any of us, uh, health providers or, or helpers or um, people helping people, I think the most important tool that we have is our heart. We have a concept in Curanderismo, Corazón cura Corazón, heart heals heart. Um, uh, it's important for us to come, that, that's the most important tool, that we come with a, with a good heart, willing to know, uh, uh, understand other cultures, willing to um, to listen, to hear the stories. Uh, in my culture, we talk in stories. So we always have to tell you a story. And um, realizing that you have a very difficult job, which is you know being the mediator between two other people, that's a difficult job. And wanting to do the best um, possible. I'm always interpreting um, people, though. And it's not so much by their verbal and what they're saying. I've learned to tune in to the whole person, the, the energy that's emanating from that person. And that energy is a result of what they think, what they say, what they don't say, what, what, they've just, what they eat, um, uh, the status of their body. Um, their spirit, their spiritual beliefs, we uh, emanate a, a, an energy around us. I have become very intuitive practicing curanderismo. And I believe intuition is also a very powerful tool, as is heart. As um, hearing impaired people are very good, very intuitive people. And so I would, uh, I would suggest that the interpreters work on their intuition and work on developing a compassionate heart. Um, understanding that in my culture, the Mexican-American culture, family, community uh, are very important. So they were storytellers that we um, don't always see life in, in as, as Western society does. We have our own ways of interpreting illness or what makes us sick or happy. So if a doctor comes to us in a very linear way and say, all right, this is your diagnosis and these are the things you should follow, uh, that is too linear for us. 
because we we also like to ask la, our abuelita what her experiences have been and we take into account that she's lived a long life we also like to ask our tío Te Chencho what he believes and he went off to war and he had other experiences we, we like to involve the whole community and so sometimes compliance becomes difficult, you know. The doctor or nurse will lay our whole lives before us and say, okay, you have diabetes and this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, and so forth. Um, and our, our abuelita might say, oh, this herb is excellent for diabetes. And, and so we lose out because many times that herb can also work with the insulin and certain um, um, ways of looking at life. So, we don't look at things in very much just a linear way. We um, really believe in folk medicine. <laughs> we really believe in, in the wisdom of our elders and, and how they have viewed illness and what makes us well. So we have a much broader picture. And why should that change? I think we all should respect who we are. And um, Western um, medical doctors have much to learn from curanderas, we have much to learn from the, them, um, so that we can be of true value and assistance to other people. And so those are the things that I would recommend for uh, people that want to uh, do the incredible job of translating for the hearing impaired. Well, I think if the if the child is a patient or a young person, then you would always start with the elders. You know, so if the grandparents would be there, then that would be you know you would introduce start with the elders. You know, um, that's just a basic rule. But certainly, the most important thing is that all family members are acknowledged. They all want to be validated. So if you just say go out the parents and and the and the aunts and uncles are there and the grandparents and they are not introduced or brought into the circle, then that is going to be seen as very very rude and it's going to cause some 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 hurt feelings. It's very important that everybody is introduced and and told who is this. This is this is el tío Chencho. This is la tía María and you know. That, that's very important. No, I think it's very important that, um, that they are brought into the conversation. I mean, they want to know what is happening, as, as with the hearing impaired, you know, if they're not being told, okay, this is, this is what just has been said, this is what's happening, if they are not getting that interpretation, I mean, that also creates a big, uh, a big gap, it, it creates um, a gap in the circle, so of course. Um, when I have interpreted um, to Spanish-speaking people, I always stop. And I, and I say, mira, el doctor dijo que esto y lo otro, y mira, es lo que quieren hacer, and todos entienden, everybody understand, any questions, okay, fine, let's go on. I think um, that that's a very important job for the interpreter, um, whoever is, you know, is uh, guiding that, because then people get left out, and they're not going to say that. More, a lot of people are reserved, so they're not going to say, ah, oh, you know, I'm lost here, I don't understand no, uh, a lot of uh, the, our elders are going to keep quiet. So it's up to us to include them. The, the Western medicine has such a um, different way of looking at things, um, mostly by time. So a doctor is going into that consultation room knowing that he has 15 minutes. And so he doesn't want anything that's going to complicate that. You know, so to bring in more people and to bring in more variables. So um, many times in Western medicine, it is not encouraged, it's discouraged. I mean, there's a lot of jokes. I have a master's in nursing, so I've worked in that system, so I know very well. A lot of jokes about extended family in, in, in the Southwest, because when you say, when a, a Western medicine doctor says, West, uh, extended family are invited, uh, all the jokes start. It's like, oh yeah, if you say that to a Mexican-American, that means, you know, 50 people are gonna be in that room. 
you know, so there's a, a lot of joking about it. So the thing is, well, I won't say extended family is invited. Uh, so we, when a Mexican American is going into the Western um, medicine arena, it's a very different arena. That is actually mostly totally alien to us. So we've learned, have had to do quite a bit of adjusting. If you want it ideal, yes, of course, then, you know, the representative, the spokesperson for the family should be invited. Well, we want comprehensive health care. I, I believe all of us do, Western doctors, Western nurses, curanderas, curanderos. I believe that deep down we do want that. And um, so it's important to use those terms, you know, to learn to use the terms that uh, doctors um, react to. Um, we want um, to provide good care and find the right medicine for that person. So uh, it would be important to have you know the the family members included or or whatever the interpreter uh, feels that that particular family needs um, the understanding of the culture of course uh, sometimes uh, we um, when I was going to nursing school there was a big push toward cultural diversity but um, it's still uncharted territory you know um, I mean, they can say uh, these are um, Mexican, it's a Mexican-American family. We believe that we want to provide good, good care. We want to include the culture. We want um, to include cultural diversity, you know, in the treatment plan, you know, things like this, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, there's so many ways to, to use the language. Um, it's all so many times determined on the, the compassionate heart of the, of the physician, uh, how much they're willing to open up and how much time they have. I think that what we need in the society more than anything is compassionate medicine. Um, I believe that what we need is the medicine of the people. When all of us start, start paying attention to what people need, uh, all kinds of people. I have a son that's, that's mentally retarded. Um, I had a sister that died of Down syndrome. I've been around different people. I see their gifts. I have worked with uh, hearing impaired people. It's um, always uh, was tremendous pleasure has been for me to ask them how can I be of assistance to you. I, I didn't want to just see hearing impaired. Um, you, they bring many gifts. Now what can I do so that I can be a, a, a good health provider to you? And they told me exactly what they needed. Whether they needed me to sit right across from them or to not turn around as I spoke or whatever it was, um, that's what they needed. And so um, that's to me the most important thing is that all of us need to have uh, stop dividing ourselves Western medicine, curanderismo, Asian medicine, but how about medicine of the people? and for the people. How about bringing back compassionate, intuitive medicine? Because um, all of us really, when we work with enough people, we really do know what is missing. And it's no longer good, it's, it's no longer useful for us to say, well, that's just the way it is. Uh, because we really can make changes. More Western doctors are starting to learn about acupuncture and Chinese herbs and Mexican herbs. Why? Because people are dissatisfied people are complaining and other people are starting to make money out of selling supplements and dream catchers and dream pillar pillows and everything else so so th there's been a market for uh, more uh, a more compassionate medicine so <laughs> that's what I would like to end with how about um, medicine of the people how about compassionate medicine y que para todos tenganos luz paz amor conciencia y armonía.